Okay, so those who have just joined, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. <clears throat> and for those who have been in for a couple of minutes, I'll just post in the Mentimeter link into the chat as well. And you should be able to click on that and uh, see some questions straight away. If it's not working, please let me know and I can give you a code separately. Um, please don't start answering the, the questions yet. We'll uh, we'll kind of move on to that as uh, as we go. If anyone can confirm they're able to click on it and see at least the first question. It's working with myself. Yeah, it's working. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we're hoping for a pretty informal exchanges, so please feel free to, you know, put your hands up or or jump in and join our conversation. Um, also, if you're new or not familiar with Teams. Um, at the top of your window, you should have the dot, dot, dot with more. Um, this is where you can also turn on live captions um, and also um, make other settings um, adjustments mm -hmm. as well. Right. So I think, um, Ben, should we introduce ourselves and get this going? Yep. Um, so good afternoon from Geneva, I guess, for those of us joining from this part of the world. Um, so my name is Juan Sopon Panic. I'm the Global CCCM Cluster Coordinator with IOM in Geneva. And with me co-hosting this session is Ben. Hi, everyone. Uh, good uh, morning from Cameroon. Uh, my name is Ben Munson, and I'm the localization specialist for the Global Education Cluster. I'm working with Wan on, on this, and we've got a, um, a nice full agenda today. Um, so Wan will give a bit a brief uh, start to give you an overview on uh, why we are here today. And then we will hear from Nemo from um, uh, Somalia to give an overview of the importance of localization in coordination. And then Marina will take us through the IS guidance document, which is uh, uh, Released, released last year and we'll be discussing and then we'll go into some breakout groups afterwards to discuss your reflections on uh, some of the recommendations and also some uh, practical examples of how uh, these things can be done at the country level as well. So that's a brief overview of today's session and I'll hand back over to Wayne. Um, thank you very much, Ben. Um, indeed, um, up until the beginning of this year, a number of us and our colleagues have been working as part of the Resolve Group 1 um, in localization um, subgroup um, to look at how we can improve um, effectiveness, but also um, meaningful participation in humanitarian coordination um, within the ISC structure. Um, the guidance from the ISC, which is, um, we shared a link with the invitation to this meeting, but you can also see the document in the chat as well, is an, a guidance on strengthening participation, representation, and leadership of local and national actors in ISC humanitarian coordination mechanism. So part of the work we're trying to do is not only to promote the use um, and the awareness of the guidance, but also see how we can better move from the paper uh, into practice. Um, so with this, we would like to invite everyone to come and join and also give, um, I guess it's, we're trying to act as a channel for you to give us direct feedback to the different clusters, um, whether at the global level or at the country level, um, we'll look forward to hearing your feedback and also examples and best practices on what is working and what is not working. So to start us off, um, we've invited um, Nemo Hassan, who is the director of uh, Somalia NGO Consortium, to um, share with us some opening remarks. Um, unfortunately, in the last minute, she has um, an event, an in-person event, which is exactly on this hour. So she's going to join us a little bit later, but uh, I want to share um, here also, the recording of the conversation we had earlier with her about why it's so important uh, that we have local actors um, as part of the humanitarian coordination. Um, ben, if you can help me share your screen. Yeah, let me try that now. Mm. 
So this should work. If you can't hear it, please let me know um, as soon as possible. I, um, it's important uh, that we have localization in humanitarian coordination. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Juan. Um, it's 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 vital to our delivery. It's vital to the, the response. Um, and I and I think it's really important that we are examining the way we do um, interventions and um, um, strengthening local equitable participation of local actors. Um, it, it's a key. It will improve our efficiency and effectiveness. Um, it also empowers those who are uh, best placed, those are who are on the, the first responders, those who are on the ground. Um, if we've learned anything from COVID-19 is that where things can completely close, the, you know, the global dynamics can completely mm. change. Um, and then programs will be halted unless we had a strong presence in the field, unless we had empowered organizations who can take up um, and fill the vacuum. So I think it's really important that we're talking to each other. We're, we are complementing each other. We are learning from each other. So it's, it is really important to include local voices and local uh, presence and not only presence, but equitable uh, participation, empowered participation in, 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 within the coordination structures and clusters are actually a key um, um, area where um, I, I, especially in the Somali context, local actors are quite absent in, in the leadership, in the leadership of, of those clusters. They are participants, they also co-lead in the regional um, um, cluster system, but in the national clusters where decisions are made, where the, the whole coordination is spearheaded, um, it, they're quite missing. So I think it's really important for us to um, strengthen that. Um, it's also very important for the local partners to ensure that they are taking up their spaces when opportunity is given, or when a space is given, it's very important they are taking it um, as well. And some of the comments that I get from some of our local members of the NGO consortium, we have about 100 um, NGOs at the moment, both national and international, and we have a, um, a localization and partnership working group where we frankly discuss on, on ways to work together. And some of the comments from the local partners is that it's all talk and there's no action. Um, we, we are there, it's, it's like a token gesture, we're not there as, uh, as well. So I think it's really important that they speak up and continue to speak up um, as well, because withdrawing from the coordination processes doesn't actually help anyone. So I think it's, it's important to be patient, to persevere, to um, stand your ground. Um, sometimes um, because of um, the different power dynamics within the ING or the UN and the local, it doesn't, it kind of um, does not empower um, the local partners to speak up sometimes. You have to be really a strong person and a strong organization to be able to push back on certain things. Um, and I think it's the responsibilities of the cluster cluster leads to ensure that um, that space is definitely given to the local partners. Thank you so much. Um, actually, two years ago, we also started talking about the different challenges that local actors might have in, you know, gaining that foothold into mm. the humanitarian coordination. Um, and, and the conversation around localization has been going on for a couple of years now. Like, yeah. what do you think is still the sticking, sticking point um, that is kind of not allowing that to happen? And I really like your use of the term like empowered um, participation, you know, because I think just turning up is, is not going to make not. the changes. Absolutely, turning up is not going to make the change. Um, when I say empowered, it, people need to be informed. Um, people need to learn, learn the lingo. There's always, always uh, the, the acronyms and, and you know, that we use as humanitarians as well. Um, I, I certainly think, I mean, I, I see slight changes in, in the last two years. Um, not, not the huge, um, that gives local partners confidence. Um, as well. Um, but uh, any change for me, it's welcome and it's good. And I think we need to persevere and push forward. Um, it, it can't be, it, it, the, the, the policy change and the practice have to go hand in hand. I, think, I know in certain places, the policy change is not there. We just talk about the change that, need, that is needed, but organizations need to change in terms of policy level, in terms of practice, 
in terms of co institutional culture as well, um, people need to change, you know, um, and change is not easy. And um, like you said, localization has been ongoing for a long time. However, that um, uh, same drive is not there, I, I don't think. And, and, and I think it's really important that we have po policies in place and we make sure that policies are implemented. I know at the consortium, we've had a, a localization framework for, um, for since end of 2019. 2020, it got lost a bit, and then we picked up in 2021. And we've actually used the guidance to to um, contextualize for the Somali, Som sorry, Somali context, and we have used what was relevant for us. So that the the, the guidance is part of, of our localization framework. Having said that, the NGO consortium is a coordination platform. We're not in a position to empower. We're not in a position to enforce or change within our programs because we don't deliver programs, but we use it to advocate we use it you know it's endorsed by the hct we're trying to talk to the cluster leads and clusters and we present it to them of what we think they should be doing um you know we've been part of the H hrp process and uh, as well and and sort of asking them to to add a page on localization on some of the clusters we actually presented and, and supported them with having an action plan on how they want to do that so you really need to be active you need to have achievable objectives you need to break it down um you know if you have a if you have a if you have a framework for two years it needs to be broken down and you need it needs to say what when and where you need to in the explicitly identify responsible key persons as well because previously what we've learned <laughs> what we've learned from our uh, framework is that it treated the un as one entity and of course the un is not one entity it treated ingos as one entity local actors in one entity. So what we're trying to do now is literally break it down and say which organization will be responsible for which. And we have to continue that conversation, I think. Change is important, but it comes slowly. So I think we need to be patient and we need to be pushed from all the different angles. I mean, it's, it has to be holistic. It cannot be only on the ground. It cannot be only at the HQ. It ha everything has to complement each other. And we need to believe as well. It cannot be lip service. Yeah. I thank you so much, uh, Nemo. And I think you've touched on across all the different aspects that is included in the guideline. And hopefully this also set up for a great discussion to be had um, today. Thank you so much, Nemo. Thank you. I wish thank you all you. discussions. Great. And I think that that uh, those words from Nemo were really, um, have really positioned this uh, conversation today very well and uh, knowing uh, the content of the guidance I think she uh, uh, touched on all aspects there as well so that was really great to see. Um, we'll just quickly do the Mentimeter now um, to see uh, some feedback from a few of you to see who we have in the call today and a bit about your opinions on the state of localization in coordination at the moment so if you haven't already clicked it please click on the uh, Mentimeter link in the chat now um and i will share my screen okay so you should see my screen now um and there's a link there as well and so the first question is um is around who are who do we have in the in the call today? So if you could all just um, complete the first question and the results should come through to the screen now as we share it. And which uh, most accurately describes the organization or institution that you work with? And we've got local and national NGO, international NGO, UN, government, donor or fund manager, humanitarian cluster or other. Just give everyone a minute to complete that. OK, so the uh, the answers are coming through uh, now and there's quite a spread of people. But as you can see, um, international NGOs and UN are, are predominantly um, represented here today. 
and we don't have too many kind of local and national um, uh, actors, which you know is a shame, um, but sometimes I think does represent some of these conversations on localization where you know sometimes these conversations are being had in silos so it's about how do we how do we um, uh, increase the uh, engagement and decrease the barriers of entry to some of these local and national agencies so thank you for that you then should uh, be taken through to uh, the next um, question and there'll be uh, um, five questions for you here and you'll be asked to rank between one and or zero and five, uh, five being strongly agree and uh, zero being strongly disagree, how you feel uh, about these five statements. everyone and, um, another minute on that and then we'll go through the answers. It's quite interesting Ben isn't it that you know even though people are saying yes I understand what the guidance is yes I know how I can you know contribute to include increase inclusion and participation but everyone also feels that you know local and national actors are not being represented enough um, in the cluster system. Exactly, exactly. I think that's an interesting point, right? Because if we 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 have access to the information, we know how it uh, uh, could be done, and we uh, yeah we're involved in the process. How is what's the missing gap between that all of those positive things and then the actual engagement of uh, local and national actors? So yeah, so very high take up on on people understanding the humanitarian cluster system, which is expected. We 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 we're in an HNPW week. Uh, most of you who, who, who know about this would be working in the humanitarian sector, so that's expected. Um, most of you have involvement in some form with cluster uh, systems, either attending meetings, part of clusters, or, or at least aware of them. However, as, as one said, we, we see that the majority of people here don't believe that local and national organisations are fairly represented and involved in the humanitarian cluster system, and which is one of the reasons that this paper, this guidance note was created. Um, however, the more, the more promising thing, which hopefully, you know, in time can lead to a bit of a change, is that people are saying that on average they, they do know the role they can play to increase the inclusion of local actors uh, in the humanitarian coordination and they've seen the guidance and started reading it. So we just wanted to do that as a kind of starter for 10 to just understand who's in the room, understand who's here and also understand the engagement you have with the cluster system and your feeling about how localised it is at the moment. So I'll stop that uh, there. And now um, I will hand over to uh, Marina who is the chair of the Global uh, Clusters Coordination Group from OCHA in Geneva. And uh, she's very kindly agreed to uh, talk us through the IASC uh, guidance note on strengthening uh, participation and why it's so important uh, that we know about it and talk through it today. So Marina, over to you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben, and it's a real pleasure to join you. Um, as um, actually Juan said at the beginning, you know, it's uh, good to have the guidance, but of course the critical part is how is it going to get rolled out and how is it going to be applied? And I think that's why we're also partially here today. But I've been asked to just give you maybe some quick background on why do we have this guidance note? What does it do? What makes it different? And I think we'll launch into some breakout groups and, and some discussions on how it's actually working and, and some practical examples. Um, so first of all, localization, as you know, has been on everyone's lips for years. And of course, the World Humanitarian Summit gave us a good um, headway into it. And we've had also other guidance rolled out, for example, during COVID, which reinforced the critical role that um, local and national actors play in humanitarian action. So what does this guidance do? First of all, it's, it's, it's a real collective effort. It was done under the ISC Results Group 1, the subgroup on localization, under the inspiring leadership of NEMO. Um, I think a huge thanks to ICFA who kicked us off on on the first draft, without which we wouldn't have gotten where we got to. 
and a lot of people contributed and it's really a collation of good practices suggestions on how to do things but essentially it deals with coordination in a wider sense so it doesn't deal with funding i want to make that clear because we often hear that one of the key issues for local and national actors is the lack of access to funding that is being dealt with by other work streams and other pieces of work the purpose of this guidance was really to look at the ISC coordination system as we know it, and to provide some um, practical advice to humanitarian coordinators, humanitarian country teams, intercluster coordination groups, and cluster um, working. So all these sort of structures that we have, more or less, wherever we have a humanitarian response. Um, it was consulted widely with local and national actors, and huge thanks to Nia, who actually. Uh, I think did five regional consultations done also in local languages. So that was also helpful to to popularize the guidance and to really get um, very direct feedback from uh, local and national actors. Um, and then it went through a number of revisions. So we ended up with the guidance that we did, but it's really split into different areas. And these are some of the areas that we'll be uh, talking about. It talks a little bit about the principles. Um, a bit of what you know, what Nemo was talking about. It's really about the equity and um, redressing some of the imbalances that exist, making sure that the relationships are equitable, uh, both in terms of participation and leadership. The guidance um, looks at um, a number of different segments. So one is participation representation. How do actual local national actors? How do they participate in coordination structures? So it looks at some of the good practices, but also suggests um, some of the ways that we can measure progress. It looks at leadership as a critical part. I mean, it's good to participate, but leadership is really critical. And then it also looks at other aspects such as um, the humanitarian program cycle and um, visibility, all these issues that again affect also funding, but also the role um, that um, local and national actors play. Now, as I said, it's not about resourcing and funding as such, but it does also recognize that you can't coordinate and you can't be expected to participate in coordination as an internal volunteer. You need resources, you need to be um, um, trained, you need to be, um, your capacity needs to be strengthened. Um, so it also um, addresses that issue. Uh, in terms of equity and, and I come back to capacity strengthening, it recognizes a two-way relationship, right? That it's about um, local national actors actually being able to share their knowledge with, let's say, international responders and vice versa, that it's not that imbalance that exists, that it is assumed that an international responder is going to have more knowledge than a local and national actor. So I think it's a step forward. Um, what does it do that other pieces of guidance haven't done? Well, first of all, it defines who a local national actor is. I know it sounds surprising. Well, you know, don't we know who that is? Well, actually, there was plenty of disagreement of who that constituted. So beyond the usual, and there's a whole range of, of actors there. So we have local and national NGOs, CSOs, all types of um, local organizations that fall under sort of the nonprofit type academic institutions. It also recognizes, obviously, local and national authorities, um, which are also local and national actors. It recognized two groups that are perhaps a little bit more out of the ordinary. One is local private sector. Uh, some questioned, you know, does the local private sector really, uh, is it a humanitarian actor? Does it play a role in, in humanitarian response? And I think the more um, large scale emergencies this, that we see, the more we see how important a role um, the private sector can play. Um, but it does say that, of course, you can only, um, you should only contribute to humanitarian response if you are in alignment and respecting humanitarian principles. And that's really critical, right? So I just wanted to sort of flag some of these elements. And the other thing that I think is quite exciting is that we have indicators to mark pro, uh, uh, to measure progress. We haven't had that before. We've had uh, various ways of collecting statistics, but the idea is that on an annual basis and a regularized process, we will collect information in the same way at the same time, being able to track progress because it's very hard when it's done in a haphazard way. This way, we can't say we didn't know. We do know now um, and we will know in two months time what the situation looked like in 2021 and we will compare it to 2020. We'll see, have we gone forward? Have we gone backwards? Um, 
the discussion localization, and it's important that everyone plays that role. And that's the last thing I'm going to say before handing back to you. One is the clusters are very often the starting point because you're not in a cluster. It's very hard. There's all there's a whole range of things that stem from the fact whether you do belong to a cluster or not, from access to funding to visibility to participation in the humanitarian programming cycle. Um, so that's critical. But every single structure can actually play a role in advancing localization. An intercluster coordination group can, a humanitarian country team can. And we really expect humanitarian coordinators to take that leadership in advancing the agenda, which doesn't mean that it's only their job. It is your job as much as anyone else's. And, you know, I have a role to play on pushing that debate in the role that I play in my daily life, which is communicating with the global clusters. One has a role to play in advancing and pushing her clusters, but also putting it up in the forefront in discussions such as this one. So we have a way to measure it. Um, we have a whole set of indicators. Some are globally tracked on a regular basis. And then we also suggested a whole host of other locally tracked indicators. We didn't want to make the structure too heavy that it would collapse before we even had a chance to start. So we knew what was already being collected. And the only thing we did is disaggregate the information to be able to look at the localization aspect. Um, there are other issues such as, for example, we suggest that um, humanitarian country teams might want to launch um, surveys to look at um, how do people actually feel about the quality of coordination and the quality of localization and coordination. Um, and the reason that's country led is because we feel that every single context is different. There are still no targets, no global targets, and the reason for that was um, it was felt and humanitarian coordinators we consulted felt that um, the picture was too variable across different contexts. It would be very hard to uh, assume that Somalia was exactly the same as Burkina Faso or, you know, two contexts can vary. Um, we thought that actually the best place for these targets or self-imposed targets to be set would be um, at the humanitarian country team level. So people can always go one step further and do more. And we've also suggested how you can do more. But the essence is that there is a basic set of indicators that we'll be able to track and we'll be able to say they're quantitative, they're not perfect. Quantity does not equate quality, but it's, I think, a really good start from where we were before. So very eager to hear what people think about it, how well it's known. And I think there is recognition that, of course, the rollout, there, there's significant effort that's needed in the rollout. And that's something that's going to be taken up under the leadership of the new, now newly created task in localization or localization features. It's one of the, I think it was five, uh, eight priorities of the IC in the coming strategic period. Anyway, back to you, Juan and Ben. All right. Um, thank you so much, Marina, um, and thank you so much for your time to come and talk to us as well about the guidance itself. Um, so as Marina and Ben mentioned, um, we're going to go into a breakout group. Um, and before we do this, I'm going to explain to you um, what we would like to see and to have. Um, we have a couple of volunteers um, facilitator for the different breakout group. Um, just confirm to me if you can see my slide, Ben, maybe? We can, yes. yes. Perfect, thanks. Um, so within the guidance itself, um, there are six areas of recommended actions. Um, we're going to focus on five of them. Oh, sorry, is it changing by itself? Anyway. Um, you have the link to the document in the chat, um, and Ben has also kindly um, put down a, a summarized version in, in a Word document that we also shared in the chat. Um, you have been assigned randomly um, together, um, and each group has a facilitator. If you're unhappy with the group that you've been assigned in and would like to, um, to go to a different group, I think you have an option to come back to the main room and I can reassign you to a different area. So the five areas we're looking at is participation and representation um, as one of the, I guess, big key areas. Um, leadership, um, because I feel like we, it's time we talk beyond just 
participating, but also start to, you know, that the local and national actors also take on leadership roles within the humanitarian coordination, um, capacity strengthening, um, I think has clearly been identified as a priority area of work necessary for meaningful um, participation and engagement. Um, resourcing, we've decided that we would not do use as part of a breakout group because there's specific um, task force um, and various number of fora that are, that are dedicated for this discussion. Um, visibility, I think ensuring that, you know, like everyone else, um, it, it's only fair, I think, that um, local and national actors also have as much visibility as, as international organizations that go in. And last but not least, also around preparedness and HCPN, so looking at um, localization, not just during the response. Um, okay. So, 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 Wang, just to uh, let you know, I don't think anyone can share a document in the um, in the chat. So maybe you want to share the the word document uh, with the briefing notes in the chat before everyone goes into the breakout groups, just so everyone has it. Um, and then the um, room facilitators have been sent over email the document already, so they can also share their screens when we're in the breakouts, but if, if one of you could share that uh, now, that'd be great as well. So everyone will have about half an hour in these breakout groups. And um, to start off, the facilitator will share their screen and uh, each facilitator will know who they are in your group. And um, on their screen, they will show about a one page piece of um, um, Word document, which basically breaks down some of the key recommendations that came out of this report, or out of this guidance document. So the first few minutes, just take some minutes to read through that, digest it and understand it. Uh, at the bottom of the page, there are also the two or three or four indicators that Marina referenced. And the, and the, and the discussion we'd like you to have today um, is basically to, to have feedback on the recommendations uh, and and you know what do they mean to you what which ones seem the most realistic and 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 uh, how would the indicators uh, read to you um and then additionally it'd be great to hear some real life examples of how some of those recommendations have already happened in country so if any of the teams that you've worked with or you are in a country office um, and i've seen practical examples of some of these recommendations in practice please do take time to share those examples and discuss them so that we can take notes of them and we can feed this rec these recommendations, feedback, and also best practice examples back to the clusters afterwards. Um, so for this last part, I'm going to ask each of the facilitator um, maybe to share back, to spend a couple of minutes and share back um, some of the highlights from their discussions. Um, some of the key points um, and or examples and best practices. Um, I also want to invite other because I had I was manning the, the plenary and the people that make it left behind. And there were some really interesting examples as well coming out. If you feel like you want to share links or your contacts um, for best practices, research studies around localization, please also feel free to put them in the chat. We can compile and put them as um, some of the notes on the HNPW session. Um, or also, if you would like, you know, if you'd be happy for us to contact you, maybe for to get more details, um, create a case study. Um, also, that please do feel free to do that. Um, so, I guess we can just. Um, so we have 15 minutes. We can just go briefly through the the list of groups. So I'm going to come to you first, uh, Ruxandra, um, on the participation and representation. Thank you, Juan, and I invite uh, all of the members of our group to please uh, feel free to to also input. Um, we had some very interesting discussions around uh, examples in uh, Nigeria, Libya and Honduras. Um, colleagues mentioned uh, that uh, in Nigeria, for instance, there were significant challenges with uh, participation um, and the a severe lack of organizations, um, organization of local uh, organizations or national. 
Um, and uh, to respond to that, there were significant efforts done by OCHA and other humanitarian partners to uh, better incorporate through orientation and guidance sessions, uh, sensitization on humanitarian principles and so on of local and national organizations. Um, in Libya, the same challenge was uh, experienced um, initially at the offset of the crisis, quite a severe lack of participation, let alone representation um, in humanitarian forums of local or, or national partners. And that was somewhat overcome initially by incorporating translation, interpretation, more Arabic uh, uh, products being issued directly, um, translation facilitated in meetings uh, and so on. However, still uh, now there is a challenge with representation and the self-organization of uh, local partners. Um, in um, Nigeria also there was a very good example of how to engage or how uh, local uh, women-led organizations were engaged and uh, facilitated uh, several forums, um, including inclusion of national organizations in the leadership of the cash working group, which had some pretty remarkable results, including uh, the representation of uh, government in the leadership structures of the coordination forum. Um, and then uh, as a result of that, the link up of uh, humanitarian cash and social um, safety nets. Um, uh, additional to that, uh, there was quite a great deal of support or increased support uh, operationally given the, the difficult environment there. Um, in Honduras as well, quite a lot of challenges were experienced uh, to this respect. Uh, however, the, the teams there um, encouraged uh, social analysis to begin with, to understand a little bit uh, better how to overcome these challenges. And it was found that uh, one of the key factors that would uh, enhance uh, um, mobilization of local actors was um, very practical effort to uh, to do that at an individual level. So there, um, it seemed that uh, the the efforts and the enthusiasm and the ability uh, to innovate of uh, leaders mobilized uh, further local support. Um, Additionally, the, as a result of all of this contextual analysis, which I believe, uh, if I understood correctly and colleagues can intervene, uh, that was essentially the key to facilitate more participation. Um, some of the um, findings were that the best uh, possible way was to understand how uh, local organizations run their processes and possibly impose as uh, little as possible of, uh, of other, other mechanisms, uh, but try to adapt where possible. Um, same for representation, that was very much related to, to the leadership uh, um, individual efforts. I wonder here if colleagues may want to complement or if that's exhaustive enough of our conversation. Thank you. Yeah, please also feel free to share more details in the chat as well. Um, I'm going to, Marina, maybe we'll come to you first. Um, since so kindly share the notes already and maybe um, in case you need to leave a bit early. Very much one and I'm afraid I may have to leave. Well, actually, I'll, I'll leave right in five minutes. So. I'm going to put in um, the main points into the chat box just to make it easier. It was an interesting discussion and um, uh, we were small in number, but mighty. What do they say? Small but mighty. <laughs> um, so I think we had some really interesting examples. First, we had a discussion on colleagues who deal with data on whether we need to have more visibility for local national actors from a data point of view. Possible reasons um, that that's not the case is 
difficult to maintain volumes of data perhaps for local national actors and the question is do we give more priority for organizations that are acting um, on those levels where data is collected um, we flag the importance of disaggregating information um, and being able to demonstrate to sorry i've got a word missing here but i think you can guess what comes afterwards being able to um, demonstrate what local and uh, local and national actors how they're contributing um, in Afghanistan, there was an example that a lot of work was, is being subcontracted, but it's often to LNAs, but it's often the international organizations that report back on collective outcomes. In Somalia, the long protracted conflict um, um, affected security and then the capacity on the ground in, can be a challenge, especially around media and communication skills and ability to communicate. Um, there was an interesting point made that national NGOs are very infrequently asked for their opinion um, on st capacity strengthening projects, which should be measured by the feedback on their usefulness and often are not because of various project cycles. There was an interesting um, suggestion, what if we had a page uh, dedicated to local NGOs? Um, what's the point of entry? Um, but it's also, there was a question of, can you make LNAs visible if their presence is not strong? We know there are contexts where perhaps Local NGOs are not very, uh, there isn't a very strong presence and is our is our role then to strengthen or not? And there were a few good practices from Afghanistan um, on uh, bringing local national actors working on AP into AP working groups, Somalia, uh, first responders during COVID that we were able to uh, negotiate with traditional elders. Um, and then there was a good practice of the twinning program, which unfortunately was discontinued. Um, and um, and sadly, only three international NGOs um, volunteered to twin with local national actors. So it would be good if there were more. But it was a good practice. At least three put up their hand. But well, we'd like to see more. So I think that's in 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 a nutshell what we discussed. Back to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marina. Um... Uh, Benjamin, should we come to you on the capacity strengthening? And I'm, I'm noting the time that we are running a little bit low. I, I hope it's fine if we go a few minutes um, long. I don't... Um, while we wait for Benjamin, Ben, maybe we'll come to you on leadership. Yeah, of course. Uh, so very quickly on leadership, I think some of the uh, points were, have already been made, but I think uh, the general feeling was it was a good starting point. I think um, people felt that it wasn't anything kind of groundbreaking, but it systematised the kind of um, areas where uh, cluster teams and uh, uh, working groups can can you know start to look at uh, ways to increase uh, uh, localization in leadership and with some practical steps. But some of the interesting feedback was it felt like sometimes a little bit of a Western way of measuring things with like a numeric uh, data or number of, you know, clusters with local level leadership, etc. And maybe it does slightly remove the uh, kind of quality aspect of things, but still the feeling was that this was a, 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 a positive step forward. Um, additionally, uh, there was a feeling that local and national uh, forums and NGO working groups were getting stronger themselves. So uh, they now have the ability to really push and demand, uh, you know, for their leadership and their engagement in the cluster system, which was really positive. Um, we felt like uh, um, INGO mentorship and cluster mentorship with local actors was, was key, but also where it was done in a respectful way, not just assuming because you're an inter international actor that you know more or know better than a national actor. And so therefore really ensuring that any mentorship that was done was done respectfully and done to the benefit of both actors and not just uh, 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 one. Um, and then I think finally, a couple of examples uh, were that at the sub-national level, most countries have some form of uh, local level leadership is promising but not many countries at the national level have a uh, uh, strong local level leadership apart from where uh, government in, uh, stakeholders are engaged uh, but there was a good example in in northeast nigeria where the child protection subsector had 
uh, received some funding uh, channeled through uh, um, uh, UNICEF to a local actor to support uh, local level uh, leadership and a uh, national co-lead uh, agency. So yeah, that was promising and more, more pilots and more best practice examples need to be used. So that's a quick overview of, of leadership. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, and we'll come to Rachel on preparedness and HDPN. And I'm I'm loving seeing this networking going on in our chat as well. Um, please, please do feel free to do that. Hi, Rachel. Hi, thanks, uh, Juan. So us was on preparedness. I mean, the the colleagues in the in the group were new to these documents, if I can say. So we spent a bit of time to to go through it before starting the discussion. Then on global comments was a quite nice example, and uh, Leah shared in the chat about the, the network analysis done in the Philippines on uh, disaster risk uh, reduction, recognizing that in fact in the Philippines from the studies they have noticed like if the INGO are stopping completely the support to the local actors, that cannot work basically. So we have to be also careful and nuanced when we speak of localization and not just like cut from one day to another the support. It has to be slowly, slowly. But that's something we, we mentioned in the introduction, but that was reiterated with this example. And we have to be careful to not isolate smaller groups, like even like academia or stuff like that. So that was quite interesting for, for an introduction. And also a recommendation on this was like maybe thinking of like consortia for small organization instead of running by themselves. Maybe like for the strategic planning, etc. might be interesting to to work on a, on smaller group to to feel more at ease and facilitate exchanges. Then we went through the document actually, and that's something I can uh, I can send back to you on like uh, comments according to each group of. Uh, paragraph and steps to to take for emergency preparedness but in overall i mean what came out it's also like when that comes to when we discuss uh, strategic planning that we speak of like making at national level but might not always be possible and was a good example on syria like they they did like some uh, smaller um, areas planning and apparently that works super well so we have to be careful also to not systematically think like okay everyone comes to to the national level to think might not be feasible and at the end might be too big to to think well so we we have to be careful also on how we we size uh, those those uh, those meetings and um, when the, we discuss the peace uh, development humanitarian development peace might be important to highlight the in most of places we work today the the conflict and the sensitivity of it when that comes down to, to the analysis. And that reinforces even more the, the importance of uh, linking with national and uh, local organizations who know, who know well the, the local context, in fact. And uh, indicators, the group wanted to, to see maybe like on, um, so there is like an indicator in country advisory group where there are like local and national actors, but they would like to see like, in how many working groups or task force where you have a, a co-lead or co-chair being a, a national representative, national actor. And that's it on the very, very summarized way. So I don't know if anyone wants to add from the group also feel, feel welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, Maybe I can add one one thing on indicators because they are, as it was mentioned before, they are quite quantitative. Uh, I work with CashCap, and in the past, I mean, we have started last year to measure level of satisfaction. So maybe this is a way that I mean, then you can disaggregate by national actors, uh, international, etc. So maybe the level of satisfaction with that uh, coordination mechanism could be also a good indicator to capture quality over. Thank you very much for that, Marga. And, and definitely, I think when we were looking at our own um, cluster performance monitoring um, tool as well, uh, we, we were also looking at a similar way and, and approach and how to dis then disaggregate the data based on the type of organizations that, that were responding to, to the survey. Um, Benjamin, I don't know if we can try to come back to you on the capacity. Um, 
Otherwise, we will follow up with you also um, to get notes um, and, and compile and, and summarize together um, between myself and Ben um, to, to be able to share back to HNPW about the discussions and, and the various recommendations as well as examples and, and lessons learned. Um, we're certainly seeing like similarities and, and you know like bouncing off of ideas, especially around things around like mentorship, like pairing up um, between international and local organizations. I think forming consortiums or um, like local NGO forums, we're seeing more and more happen. I think as as a way of also you know like uh, the power of the of the masses as well. Um, yeah. Um, ah, okay. Yes. So yeah. Ben, Benjamin, yes. sorry, please do feel yeah. free to go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we 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 went through the one area, the area of uh, capacity strengthening, and um, though we are just three in our group, we had no much members, but uh, I I love the experience um, we had from uh, Brazil. Uh, we just shared uh, case studies of Brazil and Nigeria, where um, um, we looked into the recommendations, and the recommendations were fantastic. Uh, the three, there were no there were no additions to the recommendations that were listed on the document. However, uh, the representative from Brazil gave us uh, practical examples of how. Uh, over the past five years, there has been a series of capacity strengthening activities between uh, the national actors and government and also the international uh, agencies of which uh, she belongs to. And um, this uh, capacity strengthening had led to different uh, joint action in terms of monitoring, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, engagement, in, in meetings and um, <clears throat> this 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 uh, capacity strengthening activities were done both at the local and at the national uh, level. Uh, over time, there has been uh, who have come to understand. There have been this set of organisations who have come to understand how to uh, work together with uh, government, how to also work together with other international and UN agencies in order to uh, promote their programs. Uh, examples from Nigeria, uh, just like uh, the first presenter mentioned, um, I gave an example from Nigeria where we've had uh, different forms of uh, capacity certain activities. Uh, an opportunity was created initially through having national organizations co-lead in cluster coordinations, through having uh, in, in sector meetings, we've had uh, the child protection area of responsibility, having uh, a national organization as one of the lead uh, at the national level, one of the co-lead at the national level. And we've had uh, national organizations lead local coordination group meetings at the local government levels that is in the Northeast Nigeria, we've had national organizations leading local coordination meetings where the minutes of these meetings are sent directly to OCHA in Nigeria. Uh, we've had over the past three years, uh, national organizations being part of the strategic advisory group uh, of the Global Education Cluster and the Global Child Protection Cluster. Uh, this this has been part of capacity building opportunities because in this fora, with these opportunities that have been presented for national organizations to be part of these uh, working group, or these uh, clusters uh, or coordination mechanisms, it opens some opportunities for capacity strengthening in terms of coordination. We've, we've also seen um, in the last two years, there have been a cluster core coordination training where it brought about um, national actors and government agencies to look at the humanitarian program cycles, to look at uh, different coordination mechanisms and, uh, and, and build the capacity of national and government agencies towards uh, able, being able to manage coordination uh, in the education cluster. 
even if uh, the the emergency uh, situation is now uh, decreasing and uh, all other coordination mechanisms are stopped. So I think this is the few discussions we've discussed in our group and um, we're happy to receive any question if that arises. Thank you. Sorry, I thought I saw a hand up. Yes, Ajay, uh, did you want to come in? Sorry, yeah. I, don't know if, I hope I said yeah. your name correctly. Yeah, yeah, correctly. Thank you very much. I, uh, Benjamin, thank you for um, for uh, giving a very detailed uh, information about what is happening in Nigeria. I, I, I agree completely with all the points uh, Benjamin has made. I just want to add maybe one or two more points. Uh, the localization seems to be working in Nigeria because there is uh, the orchards is playing a very very particular role in in localization. So bringing in uh, some calculated effort uh, among the there are two I think two key staff who, who pay attention to localization in orchard. I mean. It's 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 mainstreamed across the roles of orchard uh, staff, but I think it has worked well because of these uh, two colleagues who are one international, no, I think three, two two national and one international. They are the focal point, and they are driving the process and making sure that uh, it is integrated. Uh, across across all the uh, coordination mechanism within uh, in Nigeria. Thank you. I just wanted to because I'm familiar with the context, and thank you, Benjamin, for that uh, good presentation. Over to you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and then, since we're, we're ten minutes late, I I feel a little bit pressured that um, perhaps we should. Um, yeah, maybe we should uh, wrap it up. Um, but what we'll do is we'll uh, put together, we have a list of all the email addresses from the group who signed up, and we'll um, ask our facilitators to summarize the notes and the, and the feedback from you and some of the examples as well. And um, yeah, we'll share, we'll share them in the uh, coming week, I think, won't we? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and I'm glad to see in the conversation also potential for continuing this discussion um, between different people. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for your time, uh, for your contribution. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the afternoon and it's been really great um, to hear the different examples um, and also to touch base with uh, different people involved in this process. Yeah. Exactly. And I, and I think one of those things that a lot of people said, this is a good starting point and it is a starting point. It's a guide and, and, and you and, and those at the country level and those at the global level need to take this forward and really work with this. And we are committed to this at the cluster level, but we also need support um, from others uh, uh, who work on this as well. So really, I think this is a good momentum and uh, this is a useful tool, but we need to see it on in practice as well. So thank you all for your engagement and we look forward to seeing how this gets taken forward in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Take care.